want you to picture a girl around 16 or 17 years old. And as she is finishing up her years in high school, she is starting to realize that anxiety is beginning to rule her life. Inside, she constantly feeds into the lies that she can never measure up to the standards of being a good Christian, a good student, a good daughter, a good friend. The list goes on. And she gets anxious whenever she feels as though she has let somebody down. So in order to free herself from the pain of her anxiety, she starts to self-harm on her legs. But she never lets anybody know. Anytime someone asks where those scars come from, she tells them that they're just bug bites. Or she uses her clumsiness as an excuse to cover up the real reason behind them. She doesn't want anyone to know the depth of her anxiety because she hears that anxiety is just a sad excuse. That people cannot claim to be a Christian if they suffer with a mental health disease. So she puts on a face and she lives by the motto, I'm fine. And she goes through some really hard life trials, including a sickness caused by that anxiety that takes her in and out of school during her senior year. And now she she uh, heals from this physical illness, but she still suffers from the mental illness within. Then freshman year of college starts, and during her fall semester, she hears that her mom is diagnosed with stage four lung cancer, and the girl's anxiety begins to spiral. You see, she shares about her mom to her friends and to the community around her, but she never shares the personal repercussions of her anxiety in response to the news. She always seems so happy on the outside, but on the inside, she is hurting. People say that she is being so strong, but on the inside, she is weak. She starts having panic attacks out of the blue, which become more frequent as she goes through each semester. And this continues through the rest of her freshman year and into the summer when finally, in the fall of 2018, the Lord convicts her that she needs to tell others how she is hurting. And when she slowly opens up to the community around her, it is freeing. So, this girl is me. And if you couldn't already tell, the elephant in the room that we will be confronting tonight is mental health. And you see, why did it take me three and a half years to finally admit to the people around me that I struggle with mental health? Maybe it's because I witnessed the church as a whole struggle to talk about this topic. Maybe it's because I've heard that there's a stigma that if someone suffers from mental health, they just don't trust in the Lord enough or they lack faith. With this lack of conversation in the church, we contribute to a culture that associates getting help with weakness. And we contribute to a culture that labels feelings of anxiety or depression as overrated or weird. So why does this conversation matter on our campus today? In the past decade, the amount of students that are being affected by mental health on campuses has and continues to increase. As you can see on the screen, in one study in 2017, researchers asked students on campuses, have you ever felt overwhelming anxiety in the past 12 months? As you can see, men's rates of anxiety have risen from 38% to 46%, and women's rates of anxiety have jumped from 53% to 69%. Another study asked students on college campuses if they have ever felt so depressed that it was difficult for them to function. And in the past 12 months, 32% of men and 43% of women reported that this was the case. So it's quite clear that this is a very evident problem on our campuses across the nation, to individuals all over the world, and to Hokies right here at Virginia Tech. If there are so many people facing the mental health battle on a day-to-day basis, why are people so afraid to address this issue? We live in a culture where our life mottos include, it's fine, I'm fine, and good vibes only and we discredit the embrace of any other emotion with the exception of happiness. And it seems to me as if the church is following along with these worldly views. Why does the church see depression or anxiety as unbiblical when as Christians we know that these things are seen all throughout the Bible? An example can be found through a man after God's own heart. David, who wrote many of the Psalms in the Bible, calls out to the Lord in his lowest and most sorrowful state, his most depressed state in Psalm 13. He writes, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God, 
give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death and my enemy will say I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love and my heart rejoices in your salvation. I will trust, I will sing the Lord's praise because he has been good to me. You see, David is crying out to the Lord in his time of sorrow and lament. And my friends, that is a beautiful thing that should never be excused. Being able to first cry out to the Lord during his times of despair causes David to then realize his ultimate need for a savior. But that realization does not happen unless we first confront our own inadequacies. So what do we take away from this? Maybe you're asking, Evelyn, how can I be part of the solution? Well, for my brothers and sisters who are facing this mental health battle, know this. It is okay to not be okay. It is okay to seek out help from counselors and to find a community to open up to. It is okay to feel the pain of what you're going through because that pain is so real. If you have just broken your leg, you're probably going to be in pain and you're going to you're gonna want to seek out medical assistance. You'd go to your doctor, be prescribed pain medicine, you're going to get a cast and you're going to rest. And in the same way, mental health should be treated just as importantly as a physical injury or an illness. Yes, it may take medications or seeking out professional counseling or even just opening up to the people in your community, but know that seeking out these options does not make you any less of a Christian or any less of a person. Now, for my brothers and sisters who are blessed to not face this mental health battle, you are not excused from this conversation either. You have a significant role in this too. Tonight, our theme is the power of we, and my goodness, how evident that is under this topic. We need to be able to create a safe community, a safe place amongst our campus where students feel comfortable sharing how mental health is impacting them. We can't just think that we're going to be a better community. We can't just have the mindset that we're going to be more open with our peers. We have to act. I challenge you to ask the intentional questions. Skip the formalities of a surface level conversation and ask your peers how they are really doing. I know that seems scary, but it is worth it. My friends, out of everything that we have talked about tonight, I want you all to know to truly believe that our identity is not in our mental health conditions. You see, it is so easy to believe the lie that the world wants to label us as the girl with social anxiety or the guy with crippling depression the girl with scars on her body, or the guy with bipolar disorder. But these things are not our identity. We are not defined by our mental health. We are not defined by our depression or our anxiety. We are not defined by our bipolar disorder or by our eating disorder. We are not defined by a chemical imbalance in our brains. We are not defined by the trauma or the trials or the self-harm scars on our body. Yes, they are an important part of our life story, but my friends, they do not define us. So what do we place our identity in then? 1 Peter 2.9 says this, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. My friends, our identity is in the Lord, a Lord who loves us and is not ashamed of us, a Lord who calls us his special possession. And when we truly believe this, we know that we follow a God that has the power to confront any elephant in the room. Thank you.